Thank you, families. Uh, the pain never goes away, and sometimes we're reminded of that pain. We're continuing our Just Jesus series. Our focus has been on allowing God to help us develop and gain godly wisdom and how we can apply biblical principles His Word teaches us. And today I want to give you some, some guiding principles of humility, maybe a, a guideline, an outline, if, if you will. Now, I'm not talking about those incidences that have happened in your life that you were embarrassed and you learned and grew from. I'm talking about a character that God desires to build in your life. Some of the examples that I've shared with the, with the other services have been the fact that uh, Claudia and I served at a little small church outside of Albany, Georgia. And one of the revival opportunities that we had, the revivalist would invite someone to come to the podium to pray. And me being very zealous and enthusiastic and wanting to, to get up there, he called me, Brother Chet, how about coming up and, and praying for us? And it was one of those that has the stairs all the way across the front of the, the podium in the area. And it's one of those three steppers, and I got two of them. I missed the third one. And I splatted just boom, right? I mean, I'm not a little guy. Come on. So it made a little racket, and I jumped up, and I turned around and boldly prayed and very embarrassed. And all week long, the revivalists chose to make a joke about how enthusiastic I was and how I had, you know, basically fallen into the position of prayer that day. I also played high school football. I, I see one of our superstars here, upcoming stars if you want to invest. There may be a franchise dad can talk to you about that. And we had a phenomenal team, I'm going to tell you. Westover High School Patriots in Albany, Georgia. We were so good, we had an 0-31 record when I played football for them. You see, the laughs that we get, those were mild compared to when we opened up our schedule and we would look. And most of the time, you may get scheduled for one, possibly two homecoming games out of 12. We would have five or six or seven homecoming games that we got to go and sit and be embarrassed. Why did you schedule Westover? Because you knew you were going to win. So we learned, I learned through our team, humility at a young age of getting just pounded. That's not what we're talking about here, and that's not what God's Word is talking about in the book of Luke. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 14, if you would, and follow along with me, starting in verse 7. And let's see what God's Word has to share about humility this morning. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the place of honor, saying to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person and then you will begin with shame and take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, Jesus took an opportunity to teach his disciples, his friends, his closest friends. He saw an opportunity. He watched the way that they went in when there was a feast or a wedding or a festival and how they chose the places of honor. In other words, they chose the best seat in the house. Many of you came by the Sweetwater property weeks before we were ready to open and you actually drove into the parking lot once we had stripes and some of you started parking in various parking spaces to see which one was going to be the best route for you to get into the building 
And in that Monday before we opened, there was an army of volunteers that filled this auditorium and were taking these chairs down and putting them together. And all week long, many of you came by because the building was open and we were working and you sat down in this seat and you sat down in that seat and you tried this one or you tried the other one. And here's what I have come to the conclusion, especially standing in front looking and been greeting for the last three weeks. If we were to shrink the McCulloch campus and those pews and we were to sit them right here, the majority of you would be sitting in exactly the same spot that you sat there. Reason being, it's comfortable for you, right? It's familiar, and a lot of us don't like change. Now, I'm not saying that that's wrong or bad. I'm just saying that's our nature. But the more mature I get, the more comforts in life I want. I don't know about you. The more comfortable I truly want to be. And here's one of the things that I discovered as we were putting this sermon together. I realized that I do exactly the same thing with God. And I suggest probably many of you do the same thing with God. You choose God's position in your life. You choose where you're going to allow God to position his self in your everyday life. Moment by moment, we choose the position that we're going to allow God to play in our lives. But that position started once we all realized that we were sinners and needed the grace of God in our lives. That's where the positioning started. We make a choice to believe. We made a choice. Every single one of us made a choice to believe in Christ. Because God's Word says, for the wages of sin is death. Now let's define sin for us. The book of James says, to him that knoweth to do right and does it not, to him it is sin. Now, ladies, that's not an exclusion for you. It doesn't mean that you are sinless, and it doesn't mean that all of us guys are total heathens, which we mostly are, but that's a reference to mankind. Him that knoweth to do right and does it not, to him it's sin. So other than me applying that definition to your life. How many of you in this room are sinners? Pretty much every single one of us, aren't we? It didn't exclude any of us. God is inclusive, not exclusive. And once we realize that we are a sinner, we needed to come or we have chosen to come to that realization that God's position in our life needs to change. It doesn't need to stay on the outside. We chose to invite God on the inside of our life. We chose that position. And at the moment that we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believed in our hearts that God had raised Jesus from the dead, we became what we classify as saved, set apart. And God chose us as his child. We are positioned as a child of God from that moment through all of eternity. Now, we make a choice to allow God through his word, through people, through circumstances of life to grow us to be more Christ-like. You see, God has a calling and an equipping process for each one of us. Now, that process has a biblical name, or actually a theological name, and it's called sanctification, becoming more Christ-like. The goal of accepting Christ and inviting God to change our life is that we become, on a moment-by-moment, -moment, day day-by-day, year-by-year basis, more Christ-like ultimately winding up with eternity with Christ. God also gave us a great commission. Every single one of you, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, have marching orders. You've been given, you've been commissioned to do some things. The first of which is to make disciples of all nations. 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded us and he is with us at all times and at no time even to the end of this age will Jesus ever leave us or ever forsake us that's our positioning and that's God's positioning in our life we chose that when we took that step of faith and allowed God to save our souls the mission statement of Calvary outlines life change changing lives through relationships with Jesus we do that two ways by loving on people and sharing the truth of God's Word but by building those relationships and understanding the truth of God's Word this mission helps us develop our attitude towards people why do people come why are people here my prayer my hope is that because you have chosen to invite them but because the Holy Spirit is leading them here but because there's a crisis in their life and they realize that Jesus as your friend is the answer to that crisis but let's not only just trust that let's look at Philippians chapter 2 Philippians chapter 2 gives us an outline of our attitude, what our attitude should be towards others. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love and participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look out not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Well, you see, the attitude that this passage talks about it makes it really clear that being humbled, we are to count others more significant than ourselves. Now, I want you to hear that principle clearly. It doesn't mean that you totally abandon who you are. It means that you choose to put a significance on others' needs above your needs, but not at not at the neglect of your physical or your spiritual being, ladies and gentlemen. That's not what this says. It says that you're going to choose to put value on people. Your attitude towards people becomes a priority. Our mission statement says that we are going to share the truth in love. We're going to love on folks. It also says that we're going to share truth from God's Word with them. We can't love or will not love and share if we truly don't care. Now I want to say that again. We cannot nor will not love and share if we truly don't care. We share if we care. If we truly care, We'll share. What are we going to share? We're going to share the love of Jesus Christ. We're going to share our hearts, our minds, our souls. We're going to lead people to life change. We're going to love on them. We put a high value then on people. You see, I'm not sure that we as followers of Christ realize that we are the king's children. If you have confessed with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you are a child 
of the king. And as such, God, the king of kings, Jesus, the king of kings, the creator of all of this universe, will provide for your needs if you choose by faith to trust. But that's back to our choosing. That's back to our attitude. Now, wouldn't it be awesome to honor Christ by displaying humility towards others? Displaying humility toward others. You see, I'm convinced that if you want to see humility in action, you read the Gospels and you look at Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John outline Jesus' lives and how he affected life change and how he loved on people. You see, humility, according to biblical principles, is being a servant, choosing to put a significance on others ahead of ourselves. You see, Jesus waited on his disciples. One of the boldest acts of humility to me was when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. And some of us acknowledge that fact, but I, I really want us to really examine. In that culture, the person that was responsible for washing the feet of the folks that entered into a household was the lowest of the lowest of servants. And Jesus took that as an opportunity to teach his disciples what it means to serve others. He washed their feet when in all reality they should have been washing Jesus' feet. But he led by example. The most amazing example of of humility was the fact that he allowed himself, as it said in Philippians chapter 2, to die a death, a death on a cross, even on a cross, ESV says, even on a cross because death by crucifixion on a cross was supposed to be classified as one of the most humiliating deaths. But Jesus chose to die for every single person in this room, every single one of us, he chose to die for us. Why? So that he could be raised again on the third day. The penalty of sin had been paid, and we can enjoy the freedom of loving a God that loves us because Jesus bridged the gap between sin and death and eternal life for us. At Calvary, one of the philosophies that we have is, is meeting the needs of the community. We like to reach out to the community. And I think one of the best examples of, of community evangelism is when Jesus was, was teaching. And the disciples noticed that they had been there for quite a significant amount of time and made an assessment that people might be hungry, as some of you are sitting here and your tummies are beginning to rumble. And you're wondering, where are we going? for lunch. Chet, hurry up, finish up. We want to beat the Methodist to the, to the restaurant. <laughs> but did you notice in that story, none of the people shouted out, hey, we're hungry. Give us something to eat. Jesus' disciples were intuitive enough to say, Lord, Pretty sure you need to send them away because I'm pretty sure they're hungry. They've been here for a long time. And Jesus said, well, what do we have to feed them? Instead of saying, okay, send them away, what did he do? He became proactive. He said, what do we have to feed them? Well, we, we've got a few little, little fish here. We've got a couple of loaves of bread. Not enough to feed these. Bring them to me. And Jesus Christ blessed that bread and blessed those fish and began sharing it. And over 5,000 men were fed. Men can eat now. 
But it wasn't just the men, it was their wives and their children that were there as well. And at the, at the end of the eating, the time that he had given them to eat, they took up baskets of provision that were left over. Did you see the example of what Jesus did here? He met the immediate need that everyone had that was around him of filling them because they were hungry. But he didn't only meet the need that they had then, he met the need for the next day as well because he provided for their future as well. Well, that's the culture of what we really, truly want to develop here. Why did you build an auditorium that has these seats, all of these seats? Because not only do we want to meet the immediate need that God has given us to share the gospel with over 40,000 people in Havasu that do not have a relationship with him, we want to meet the needs of the future as well next week and the next week and the next year, and we want to grow. Not so we can say, whoo-hoo, look at us, we're big. So that we can say, how can we meet your needs? You see, for almost 20 years, I served as an intentional volunteer. And what that means is you have a job description, you show up, but you don't get a paycheck. Like many of you do. You're an intentional volunteer on mission for Jesus Christ, and you're connected to the family called Calvary. And we have entrusted and empowered each and every one of you to adopt an attitude of service in this community. You do not have to wait for our permission. We have given you permission to go and serve. And for almost 20 years, I was able to do that in three different churches. And then 12 years ago, God said, I'll give you permission to go to Lake Havasu City. And I was hired as the executive pastor at Calvary Baptist Church, not because I was the most qualified. There was other candidates that were honestly more qualified than I was. Not because I was the best looking, although I have some fans and they would argue that point. And definitely not because I am the smartest. But here's the reason why God allowed me to come. For 20 years, God trained me to serve. I was willing to serve in any area God would allow me to serve. I didn't need a title and I didn't need a paycheck. I simply wanted to serve. Now, many of you are sitting here and you're going, I'm doing the same thing, Chet. Think of this. You're in your training process or you're in your application process. One of the two. And some of you are going to sit here and say, well, you know what? I'd serve, but nobody's asked me. So here's an open invitation for every single one of you in this auditorium. It's an open invitation to join the movement of what God is doing through the family called Calvary Baptist Church and the mission to lead people to life change. Please, you have our open invitation to join the team and serve in whatever area it is that God has equipped you to serve. You see, we do truly value the ideas and the ways that you have figured out how to connect in this community and how you have chosen to help lead 40,000 people, 40,000 souls who need a wonderful Savior and His name is Jesus Christ. We want to equip and partner with you in doing that. Here's how I believe that can be accomplished. You want to win people over? Begin serving them. It starts first and foremost, I believe, with your family. You start serving your family, and they'll see a difference. You start serving those that you work with, 
and they'll see a difference. You start serving those that are the ones that provide services for you in this community. Blow their mind by serving them. Here's a great idea. My, my daughter is one of the praise team members, and she's also a registered nurse at Lake Havasu uh, Hospital here. On Saturdays and Sundays, the cafeteria is not open, I understand. But those nurses are diligently working, and those doctors are diligently working. And each floor has an area or a room that you can take a meal to, just put it in the room, say, we love you, God bless you, and leave. Great opportunity for service, because this is what you're going to begin to hear. Why, why do you do this? I'm fulfilling my mission. Well, what's your mission? To love on people. And to share the truth of God's word, not only did I want to provide your need today, because you're providing for all of the needs of these that are sick, but I also want to provide for your needs for tomorrow. That's just an idea. I'm sure you have a lot better ideas. And here's what we'd love to do. We'd love to empower you to put those ideas to work. Sometimes we even get the opportunity to go overseas to a place like Saranda, Albania. There's going to be 15 missionaries leaving on June the 8th, headed to Saranda, Albania. You'll say, well, Chet, there's 40,000 here. Why would you go over there? It's a both and, here and there. We get to lead almost 50,000 people that don't have a relationship in Saranda, Albania to life change as well. How? By loving on them and sharing the truth of God's Word. Some of you are going, hey, there's no way I'm going overseas. That's great. That's fine. If God hasn't called you to go, don't. But if He does, please do. Some of you are willing to jump in a vehicle and drive to Idaho. <laughs> got, a, got a plan for you. It's a mission trip headed to Idaho. You can go and love and serve. This past Monday and Tuesday, there were men and women they were at Smoke Tree Elementary School painting special needs rooms. The rooms for special needs children. Why? Because we realized that there was a need. Do not wait to be asked to serve. If you have the ability to serve, you have a creative idea from God, move forward and serve. Move forward and serve. You win people over, I believe, by serving. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. C.S. Lewis. Will you join me in prayer?